And really, this is what manned exploration of the moon is all about, isn't it? You, you can't program to find that kind of thing. You've got to go out there and dig for it. Well, you, you can, but only at greater expense than the manned flight, as difficult as that is itself. It's more expensive to program an elaborate, flexible, remote control station than to use the manned capability we have to bring back pieces of rock. Will the knowledge we gain from the moon tell us more about uh, Mars, which it has been suggested perhaps once uh, had an atmosphere as, as heavy as ours, perhaps uh, once had maybe even intelligent life? M yeah, Mars uh, has a trace of moisture uh, and uh, is a possible abode of life. Mars was used and proceeded into a very diverse form. Uh, we uh, will... Uh, be uh, a paleontologist or an archaeologist, maybe a very important members of the crew of the Martian expedition. Uh, the, the surface of Mars looks suspiciously like that of the moon, a relatively dead body. But uh, we don't know. And all I do know is, or we do know, is that there are two planets in this solar system that could bear life on them. One of them, the Earth, does. The other one is Mars. If we find any life on Mars, no matter how primitive, we will have to conclude but the chance of life developing anywhere on an Earth-like planet is quite high. And the consequences of that, with regard to the billions of planets around us, are stagger the imagination. So we may uh, someday meet some intelligent life form from another planet, although... Probably not Mars, but... Goodness only knows that's uh, many years <laughs> ahead of us. Walter? Thank you, gentlemen. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. Back here at our CBS News Space Center, where we've been following this remarkable flight of the Apollo 8, as man, for the first time, orbits the moon 230,000 miles from Earth as it swings around the Earth in its orbit of our planet. In about three minutes from now, the Apollo 8 is scheduled to pass around the far side of the moon again, across the leading edge of the moon as we view it from Earth. Uh, this its second pass behind the moon, and this is the pass by which it will fire to go into circumlunar orbit. Everything seems to be going exceedingly well in the uh, spacecraft. And that, of course, is very good news in Houston, Texas, not only to the men of the Manned Space Center and Mission Control in Houston, but uh, down the road a piece there south of Houston, around the Space Center, in the uh, lovely residential districts where most of the astronauts live and live the wives and families of the three men who are today on this Christmas Eve circling the moon. Nelson Benton is standing by in Houston, and Nelson, perhaps you can tell us uh, what the families of the astronauts are doing on this historic morning when their husbands' names enter the history books alongside of Magellan and Vasco da Gama and Columbus and all the other great explorers. Home of command. sat in the kitchen around uh, one of these mission control speakers which you have there beside you and which uh, proliferate all around Houston and they listened to the lunar insertion. Uh, we're told that uh, Mrs. Borman was a bit apprehensive until Apollo 8 came from behind the moon and there was again radio contact and her first reaction was a big smile and then she said she wished that she could see the elation on the faces of the flight controllers. Well, we wish we could, too. She thought that uh, the TV uh, telecast was good, that the crew sounded good, and uh, she plans, of course, to stay home tonight, late tonight, and uh, monitor the progress of that uh, trans-Earth insertion. We hear from the Lovell home that uh, Mrs. Lovell had friends with her, that uh, they started watching about 2 a.m. Houston time this morning, and uh, monitored the progress. Her comment when communications were reestablished was fantastic. We also hear, Walter, uh, from the Lovell home that the children uh, were asleep during all that, but uh, they planned to get up and watch television. We've had no report at all, however, from uh, the home of uh, William Anders. Walter? Nelson, we just uh, heard from uh, Mission Control to the... With five seconds away, let's listen of Apollo 8. We're uh, at eight seconds away now from uh, time of loss of signal.
Okay, they said goodbye uh, to the ground as they passed over at, uh, on their next pass over the backside of the moon. Uh, this is the uh, pass over the backside where we will have our lunar orbit insertion burn number two. To quickly go over those numbers again, uh, we uh, have a, a ground elapsed time of ignition at uh, 73 hours, uh, 35 minutes, uh, 5 seconds. Apolloon, uh, 60.7 nautical miles. Paraloon, uh, 60.6 nautical miles are expected to result from the burn. The burn, one, a very short duration, uh, 9 seconds, uh, delta V, uh, 135 feet per second. We'll be looking for them when we next acquire at uh, 43 minutes, 30 seconds uh, from this time. So at uh, 73 hours, uh, 5 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8, this is Apollo Control Houston. That means that that uh, burn, the firing of the service propulsion system engine for 9 seconds to slow the spacecraft down another 95 miles an hour to around 3,648 miles an hour, which will mean it will go into a circular orbit around the moon, comes at 9.23 a.m. Eastern time, or 30 minutes from now. That will occur on the far side of the moon. Again, we will be out of touch with the spacecraft at the time, and we will hold our breaths until the spacecraft emerges another 10 minutes or so after that uh, on the uh, near side of the moon and we get some information that all has gone well. Everything has gone so well so far, no uh, difficulties expected with this particular burn of the SPS engine. This Christmas Eve of 1968 is the day that man... of the three American astronauts, Borman, Lovell, and Anders. He was set foot on the moon later thanks to this pioneering, daring exploration that they have made today. Perhaps the most exciting moment of this morning was at 4.59 a.m. Eastern Time when Jerry Carr, Marine Major, on the ground at Manned Space Center in Houston, Texas, said over those 230,000 miles out there to the moon, the custards in the oven, safe journey, guys. He was speaking to the crew of Apollo 8 as they disappeared or around to the far side of the moon and out of touch with Earth and uh, there put themselves by firing their single engine into orbit around the moon. And the words that came back to us then were from Bill Anders, the youngest man uh, in the three-man crew, who said, thanks a lot, troops. We'll see you on the other side. I don't think there were any more dramatic moments than that, or words than that uh, in our time. And then it was 36 minutes later. We waited until the spacecraft circled that far side of the moon, out of touch with the communication facilities here on Earth. Those men all alone, more alone than man undoubtedly has ever been. Uh, they came around the other side of the moon, the, the trailing side of the moon as we look at it from Earth, and those first words from Mission Control, we've got it, we've got it. John McLeish reporting to us from Mission Control at Houston, and then the first words uh, we heard from the spacecraft as it came around from uh, Frank Borman, the spacecraft of the flight commander, who said, keep a good eye on us. Very shortly thereafter, the uh, spacecraft uh, was reporting back, Jim Lovell, the navigator, telling us about the features on the moon as he saw them. Perhaps we can uh, listen again and see again uh, as uh, Borman report, or as Lovell reported uh, from the, that pass of the moon, but even more important, the second pass of the moon when the television cameras went on. They went around that far side, and here was that report.